All right. I've never seen it. Well, sometimes we clap for the announcements. That's good. We're a motivated group. That was a good set of announcements. I really like that last line. We're moving people from where they are to where God wants them to be. A good morning to all of our online church. You're not in the room, but it was a beautiful time of worship. I hope that it was there as well for you. Today is the first Sunday in February. January just flew by, and it seemed fitting that we would start a brand new series that was designed uh, to address love, love in our marriages, a love for those who are, are going to be getting married. And so today we're starting a new series called Marriage Matters. So if, you, if you're a note taker, if you're married, if you're going to be married someday, this series is for you. Don't miss a week in February. I promise it's going to be a blessing to you. And the goal here for us is to provide some tools to help us live a biblical marriage. And we're going to focus on just a few commitments that we can make together as a husband and a wife or as a, as a, you know, a couple going to be married someday that I believe will fail-proof your marriage. They will fail-proof your marriage if you keep these commitments. And so just to start, I want to ask a couple questions, get us all on the same page, uh, enjoying a little bit of time together. But for the ladies, I got a question for you. How many of you, when you were a little girl, you dreamed of the perfect marriage? You dreamed of the perfect wedding day, and it was going to be uh, the perfect chapel and the perfect guy, uh, and, and you're going to be carried across the threshold into the perfect house, you know? And maybe you even had some of your kids named before you met your husband. How many of you ladies had that dream? That dream? That dream? Yeah? How many of you men dreamed that? <laughs> no. Not, not a single one. And, and because if you would have raised your hand, we would have kicked you out back, you know? <laughs> You're not, not welcome in here. Uh, but no, no, for the guys, how many of you dreamed of getting married one day and having sex twice a day and three times on Sunday? Can I get an amen? An amen. <laughs> and how many of us are all still dreaming? How many of us? <laughs> the, the truth is, is that we all come into our wed marriages with lots of expectations. And then when our marriages don't meet these set expectations, we have just as many letdowns. In fact, some of you right now, you are, are living in a, a wounded, a wound of a past relationship, or you're in a very tough relationship right now, and you're wondering, is a good marriage even possible, Josh? Is a good marriage even possible? And I want to say beyond a shadow of a doubt that yes, absolutely a good marriage is absolutely possible, but I also want to be very truthful and tell you it's not likely. It's not likely if you have a marriage the way the world has marriages these days. It just isn't, it just isn't likely. In fact, we all know it's true. Think about the statistics. They say, they say that 50% of all marriages that start won't make it to the end. And that the younger you are, the less likely it is that your marriage will make it. And of those 50% that do make it, the vast majority of them are miserable with no intimacy, no connection, and they're just staying together for the kids. Not good news. And that, that's if you do it just like everybody else does it, which raises the question, where in your life would you accept 50-50 odds where else in your life would you accept 50-50 odds? Think about it. If there was a 50% chance that you would get cancer if you kept eating, let's say, a specific type of cereal that, that you just love, you would drop that cereal, wouldn't you? You would change it. You would start eating something else. Or if there was a 50% chance that all your investments were going to disappear, that all the money in your bank account was going to disappear this week, you would do something to make sure that your money was safe. And if I told you that if you walked outside on Monday morning, uh, that you would be attacked by a roaming herd of man-eating hamsters, you would probably, you'd probably change your plans, wouldn't you? Because nothing in our life that's significant, we would never leave it up to a 50-50 chance. And yet, listen to how crazy this world is. In order to get a driver's permit, you have to go through a class work with a professional, get graded, and then you're able to apply for a license to get a license, right? But to get married, all you need is just a couple of 20s and go downtown and, and you can get married. Just no preparation. And so this month, we want to invest in our marriages because our marriages matter. 
And if you're not married yet, what I pray is that you will do something completely different from the rest of the world, that you'll do things God's way. That you'll get married in a church by a pastor because we're not making a, a legal agreement. We're making a spiritual covenant before God with our spouse. And we're asking God to help us have the kind of marriage that he wants us to have. And if you do that, you're going to say some vows. Some of the vows kind of like what Allison and I said uh, back in 2003. I, Josh, take you, Allison, to be my lawfully wedded wife. To have and to hold, and then can we, if you know it, can we all just say that next line together? To have and to hold from, from what? From this day forward. From this day forward. I love the hope that is built into that line in our vows. From this day forward. That means it doesn't matter what happened in the past. It doesn't matter what we struggled with. It, it doesn't matter all those, those mistakes. Today, we're crossing a line as a couple, and we're saying from this day forward. Things are going to be different. I'm committed to you before God from this day forward. And the commitment that you make before God is a real one. What did we say? We said for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, I will forsake all others and be faithful to you as both as we long shall live. I just said that wrong. As both as we wrong shall live. <laughs> as both as we, as both, whatever. You know how it goes. <laughs> and then we say, so help me God. And that's a declaration. We say it as a declaration. But I think that we need to say it as a re prayer request to God. Like, okay, so all that's true. Now help me God. Now help me. Because I'm going to need your help to keep a godly covenant between you and my wife. And in, in, in a world where the odds are never in your favor, may the odds be never in your favor, uh, when it comes to our marriages, we want to make some biblical-based commitments that are going to fail-proof our marriage. So each Sunday in February, we'll look at a different commitment from Scripture. But this week, we're going to look at seeking God. That's our first thought that we want to drive home this morning. To fail-proof our marriage, we want to seek God. We're going to commit to seek God. Now, the problem is... On the road to marriage, most of us aren't seeking God. What are we seeking? We're seeking a, a spouse, right? We're, speak, we're, we're looking for that perfect someone, that, that one who's going to meet all our needs, that, that person who's going to fulfill our dreams, because we've just been taught and we believe that in life you can't be happy until you find the one, the one. And so maybe it looks something like this for some of us guys, right? You know, we, we, we meet this girl and she's so pretty and it's like, it's the perfect country song. You know, she had a red, she had a, uh, a suntan line and red lipstick. I worked so hard for that first kiss and a heart can't forget. That's an old country song. Can't forget something like that. And, uh, but, we, but we say, man, she was just so pretty and she smelled good and she looked good. And I know, Dad, I may have found the one. Right? Or for the girls, like, oh, he was so sweet, and he's so smart, and he's so funny, and he looks really good in a cowboy hat. And I did, did I mention the muscles on this guy, right? I, I don't know what ladies actually say, uh, but they, they, they tell all their friends, hey, I may have met the one. Because people in our culture, we've just been, we've been raised to believe that if you're going to be happy, you have to find the one. And, and we get that. We get that. But Scripture would have us to make what seems at first to be an insignificant shift of thinking, but it turns out it's a huge shift in thinking. When culture is telling us that you can't be fulfilled, that you can't be happy in life until you find the one, the problem is you were, there was never going to be one. There, were, there was never going to be one that could take God's place. You can't put the weight of what only God can do in your life on a person. That They can't be that for you. And so... We're going to see in Scripture that God is your one, and your spouse is your two. God's the one, the spouse is the two. And you may be thinking, Josh, you're just talking semantics right now. But in fact, it is one of the most basic fundamentals to having a lasting relationship. Our marriage matters. And so we're going to look at what does it mean that God is my one and my spouse is my two? Once Jesus was asked, hey, Jesus, what's the most important commandment? They were trying to trap him. And Jesus answered, and you'll recall that he did not say to love your spouse 
with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, did he? He said, he essentially says God is your one. He said in uh, Matthew 22, 37, basically love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. God is your one and your spouse is your two. Now I realize today that not all of us gathered in the room and watching online are married. And so I want to talk to a couple different groups of people this morning. And we're going to start off by talking to those of us who are not married, but you'd like to be. You'd like to be someday. So how many of you, you're not married, but you would like to meet your two someday? Your two, two someday? Come raise your hands up high. Don't be scared. Raise your hands up high. And if you've got your hands, look around. Look around at other people with their hands up. <laughs> Might make a little connection here. Who knows? Get married. A year later, have a kid. If it's a boy, you name him Josh. There we go. <laughs> All right. All uh, right. So here's our commitment, uh, single, single men and ladies that hope to be married someday. And I hope that this becomes a driving force in your life. Write this down. I will seek the one while preparing for my two. I'll seek the one while preparing for my two. In other words, I'm going to seek God while I'm preparing for you. I may have not even met you yet, but I'm going to seek God while I'm preparing for you. And above that, everything else. We want to honor God, love God, seek God. We want to know God and be known by Him. We want our lives to bring glory to God on our road to holiness. And so we're not seeking a spouse. We're seeking God. And while we seek God, He prepares us for the two. But the challenge in our culture today is that there's a lot of people who call themselves Christians who want to say, I'm just going to put the God thing off till later in life when it really matters. I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of put that off for now. I'm going to have fun while I'm single and young. And, you know, one day, you know, down the road when I get married, then I'll do the church thing again. You know, I'll get serious about my holiness. But for now, I'm doing the club thing. I'm going to go to the club and I might jump from bed to bed to bed. And I'm going to live ungodly now, but I'll get my life together. I'm, I'll get my life together someday. And that thinking is, is dangerous. And that thinking is incredibly common. Andy Stanley, a world-renowned uh, pastor out of Atlanta, Georgia, he told a story that really illustrated this well. He said there was a young girl who was a very committed Christian, and she went off to college, and she kind of gave in to some of the peer pressure, got in on the party scene. And the party scene led to drinking, and the drinking led to drugs. And eventually she found herself just going with guy after guy after guy, and she fell into this lifestyle of a very destructive sin. But all the while, in the back of her mind, she was like, I still believe in God. I still believe in him. And someday, one day, you know, I'm going to come back around and I'm going to do the right thing. But she continued to live in this very ungodly lifestyle. And then one day, she met that one guy, the one that she hoped to marry. This, he was godly. He was a good-looking guy. He, he was a leader. He was making a difference. He was discipling other men. He had a great career. And so she goes to her mom and she says, Mom, I met the one. I met the guy. He's everything. He's godly. He's good looking. He's the kind of guy I want to marry. So I'm, I'm just going to kind of make it clear to him that I'm available. And uh, the mom said very lovingly, she said, sweetheart, you need to know that a guy like that is not looking for a girl like you. It doesn't matter what you want. You'll attract who you are. Like attracts like. So, if you hope to have a godly marriage one day, listen up, single people, live for God today. If I'm going to have a godly marriage someday, I want to live for God today. Seek God today. Become the person that you would want to marry. If you want to marry someone who's been... Uh, has diff 18 different sex partners, then go for it. You know, keep living it up at the club scene. If you want to have that 50-50 chance of your marriage making it, just like everybody else, but if you want something that's different, if you want something that's lasting, seek God today. Seek the one while you're preparing for the two. That's great advice. Now, for some of the married folks in the room and those of us who are married online, 
here's what we're going to do. We're going to, this is our commitment. This is the notes that you're writing down. I'm going to seek the one with my two. I'm going to seek the one with my two. And maybe, maybe we could all say that. If you're a married couple, let's just say that together. I'm going to seek the one with my two. Here, ready? ready? One, two, three. I'm going to seek the one with my two. And let me tell you why this is so important. Because our marriages, they'll never be what God wants them to be unless God is the one and our spouse is the two. And so often we get this mixed up, right? We want our spouse to be our one. You complete me. You make me happy. You are my everything. Or we might even put God in the one spot, but then we put our kids in the two spot or our career in the two spot. But it doesn't work that way. God has designed our marriages where God is number one and our spouse is two. And when you and I, when we try to put our spouse or our boyfriend or our girlfriend in the one spot, what we're doing, is we're putting them in a position that they could never, ever fulfill. They could never be that person. And not intentionally, but we idolize them. We put them in a spot that only God can stand. And so we say, you make me happy. You, you complete me. And I feel so good when I'm around you. And without you, I'm nothing. And we're putting them in an untenable position. No one but God can fulfill your needs. And when they fail and when they let you down, and they will because we're all human beings, we go from idolizing them to demonizing them. You're not what I expected. You're not doing what I expected you to do. You're not fulfilling my needs. You're not completing me. And maybe you've seen this play out. Maybe at, you know, at, the, at first they were dating, and he's like, wow, she's so organized. Right? She's so driven and she's a go-getter. And I just love how passionate she is about life. But then they get married and just a, you know, a minute later, and now it's like, holy smoke, she's a control freak. <laughs> right? My goodness. Uh, she's nagging all the time and she wants everything done her way. The girl's crazy. And at first we're idolizing her and then we're demonizing her. Or ladies, like, oh, he's just so laid back. And he's so easygoing, and he never gets worked up. And then two years later, you're married, and he's a bump on the log, right? He never does anything. He's not a leader. He just sits around and plays his games all day on the couch in the basement. And, and you're like, well, at first I idolized him, and now I'm demonizing him. And it's a recipe for disaster. Every time we try to put people in a position that only God can fill our, fulfill in our life, it's a recipe for disaster. So married couples, let's keep this straight. What do we do? We seek the one with the two. We seek the one with the two. We seek God with our spouse. Now just practically, you say, how do we seek God with our spouse? And there's a bunch of different ways. You, you could think about, you could probably make a list of ways. We could leave here today with eight or ten ways that you could seek God with your spouse. But if we, if we left with eight or ten things, chances are we wouldn't do any of them. That's just the way it goes. And so we're going to zero in on just one spiritual discipline that we can bring into our relationship with our spouse to seek God. And yes, I said spiritual discipline. Discipline, that, that, that's, not a, that's not a fun word. But it has to become a habit in your life. Uh, how many of you have read or heard of the book, The Power of Habit? The Power of Habit. Has anybody read that or heard that? Okay, wow. Yeah, some of us. Good deal. Well, in that book, the author talks about what they, they uh, refer to as keystone habits. Keystone habits, meaning that there are certain habits that if you do these things, they create forward momentum into other good habits. Right? And then there's also these keystone habits that if you don't do these things, they create negative momentum into negative habits. And you've probably seen this work itself out in your own life. Because there's certain simple habits that we create that create um, forward momentum, like making your bed first thing in the morning. It, it creates forward momentum. Or brushing your teeth or, or flossing. You do that one thing, and it just kind of sets the trajectory, gets, gets, the, gets the ball rolling for other good habits in your life. And then there are certain habits that you, if you do them, they create negative momentum. So sleeping too much, right? If you sleep too much, 
It creates negative momentum. Or if you're overspending, or um, if you're eating poorly, or, or always scrolling through social media, these types of things create negative momentum in our lives. And we get that. How, I mean, how many of you understand that momentum matters in your life? Momentum matters. And, and your habits really matter because our marriages matter. And so to borrow the author's turn of phrase, this keystone habit is seeking God. That's what I want to leave us with today. I want us to go away with us today, that as married couples, we're going to seek God together. We want that to be our keystone habit. Seek God together in prayer. Now, some of you wives right now, you might, might have just gotten a little bit giddy. You're like, awesome. You know, the, the, the pastor is asking my husband to pray with me. I, I'm, I'm so happy about that. And the guy in the meantime, he's like, oh, great. You know, we've got to pray together. And I just want to acknowledge all the awkwardness uh, in that. And we'll, we'll talk about that more in a moment. But first, I want to talk to those of us in the room um, who want to get married someday. We're not married yet, but we're praying for God to send us our two. And I want to tell you this, that prayer is so intimate. Prayer with the one we love is just so intimate. And so you, you join your spouse in petition with God, the one who brought you together, and you pray to him about something that really burdens your heart, Some, someone that you love, that you both care about deeply. And I want to tell you, it is very intimate. It's intimate. I mean, there's a reason why the Wickers have four kids today. And uh, seeking God is an intimate time in prayer. And so if you're just dating, I've got some dating advice for the single people in the room. And this is free advice. This isn't in the Bible. Right? This is just, this is, this is just free. Um, single folks, don't pray together on a sofa. Just don't do that, okay? Single folks, don't pray together on a bed. Just don't do that. Don't ever pray together horizontally. You just, I'm just saying. If you, if you aren't married, what you want to do is you probably want to pray in some public places, maybe a restaurant, you know, with a, with a table between you. That's my advice if you're dating. If you're married, pray in the bed. Pray in the bed, right? God bless, uh, God bless the marriages in the room. Um, 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says this. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, if we pray, if we seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, then God says, I'll hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Or you might loosely apply it this way. I will heal their marriages. I don't know how you can get through life in your marriage without God. I don't know how. And you might, you might just start this way. You might just start praying together as a couple over your meals. You, you know, you just commit that every time we eat, we're going to thank God together. We'll just start there. Something kind of simple, something kind of easy. Or it could be something as simple as just praying over the day, whether it's at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day, just praying together as a, as a, as a couple. God, you know, bless my spouse today as he, as he does this. Bless my spouse as she goes about doing that. And we'll start there. Or maybe you're kind of one of those more organized couples. They do exist. And maybe you need a list, right? And so, and so you pray for your kids, you know, kid one, kid two, kid three, kid four. And you pray for decision one, two, three, and four. Write this all down. And it makes it so, so helpful for the husbands, right? Because the last thing we want to do is get embarrassed in prayer time and just get stuck with not, not knowing what to say. You know, we, we just don't want to be that guy. And so maybe, maybe a list would work for you, praying for your friends at work, praying for somebody uh, that you love. Or, you know, you could text prayers, just ideas. You text prayers as spouses and, and maybe, you know, the wife, she texts her husband and says, hey, I'm praying that God gives you peace today. And the husband could text back and say, hey, I'm praying that you would give me a peace tonight. I don't know. I don't know. Peace. Peace. Uh, and it creates an incredible amount of spiritual intimacy when we're praying together. It's a spiritual habit. A habit that, watch this, if you will pray together regularly, chances are you're going to be in church together regularly. If you'll pray together regularly, chances are you'll be in a city group together. You'll have people praying for you together. You'll be bringing people as a couple to know and experience the love of God in your church. 
It has huge spiritual implications. But beyond the spiritual, what about the practical? It's really hard to fight with someone you're praying with. It's really hard to call someone names that you're praying with. Oh, you idiot. You know, you, you whatever. Uh, if you're not going to, you're not going to get into pornography. You're, you're not going to uh, commit adultery against someone that you're praying with every day. You're just, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to do that. And how about this? Just full circle. You're not going to divorce someone that you're praying with every day. That prayer binds you together. So we want to seek God together. And I know some of you are thinking right now, it's probably the men, but you're saying, Josh, you're asking too much. It's too much. And okay, I'm going to say fine. Play the odds. 50% chance against your marriage. And if it does make it, the chances are better than not that you're living a life just sticking together for the kids. Those are the odds. That's, that's how life looks right now if you do it the way everybody else is doing it. Or you can get like holy, holy, crazy, holy. You can get crazy, holy. And you can commit to praying together and you can be asking God, so help me, God. We want you to be first in our marriage. We want you to be first in our relationship, in our day. So we want to seek you daily. Let me give you some quick stats. Family Life, they did a, a survey several years ago, and this survey found that of thousands of Christians that they uh, surveyed, fewer than 8% of Christian couples pray together regularly. Fewer than 8% of Christian couples. Now the good news is that for those 8% that did pray together, they found that fewer than 1% of their marriages ended in divorce. So we could tell the devil to put that in a pipe and smoke it, devil. We know, we know how to win this battle. Fewer than 8% actually prayed together, but of those that did pray, only 1% of those ended in divorce. So that's 50-50 on one hand, living life the way everybody else is living it, or a 99% chance of your marriage making it. On the other hand, the choice is ours. We get to make the choice. And I believe that Satan does not want you to pray with your spouse. I, I believe that he doesn't want you to pray with your two to your one. So I want to spit in Satan's eye today. And I want to ask you to commit to pray with your spouse. Commit to pray with them. Pray. pray. Think about this, Matthew 6, 33. It tells us, seek first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added unto you. Seek God first together. Now you may say, well, you know, we don't do that. I got it. But can you change? Can, can you try? Can you mature a little in your faith? Can you become more holy? Your marriage matters. You say, well, we don't really like each other right now. Okay, fine. But from this day forward, can you try? Can you give it a chance? Your marriage matters. Well, you know, we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to do it. That's, that's not an excuse. You didn't know how to have sex before you got married, but you figured that out. Didn't you? You can figure this out. You can pray together. You can go to God together with intimacy. You say, well, I'm uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable doing that. Just get over that. Your marriage matters. Marriage matters. And I'll close this morning with a story that I heard a pastor tell. And then we'll pray. He said, I went to visit an older couple. The wife was dying in the hospital. She was 88 and her husband was 90. They'd been married for just over 70 years, and, it, and then he said, uh, it was a moment that I'll never forget. I walked into this jam-packed hospital room with several generations of family members there, and they were all worshiping as the matriarch of the family was about to pass from here to heaven. And this feeble 90-year-old man opened up his Bible to Psalm chapter 23, and through tears read 
read it to his family and over his wife. And then everybody joined hands and he put one of his hands on his wife's head and he committed her to God in heaven. And he thanked God for 70 years of getting to serve God with his best friend. And then he kissed her and he said, I'll see you soon. Moments later, she slipped from this world into eternity. And the pastor said, I looked at this guy and I told him, I want what you have. What's your secret? And the old man told the pastor that we have messed up. We have messed up in so many ways, too many ways to count. But the one thing we did is we were faithful together in prayer. What I want to ask you to do now is to hold hands with your two. If they're sitting next to you, hold hands with them. And never stop seeking the one. If you'll do that, I believe that the God in heaven will heal your marriage. I believe that he will hear your prayers. He'll help your marriage be everything he wants it to be because your marriage matters to God. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would do a work in every heart. God, for those who are not yet married, but they hope to be one day, I pray that they would fall in love with seeking you. Seeking you, their one, as you prepare them for their two. For those who are married, I pray that they would commit to always seeking you with their two. And as you pray today, let me ask a broad question. If you recognize that you really haven't been seeking the one as you should in prayer, and today you want to make a commitment or a recommitment to be a person of prayer from this day forward. I commit to not neglect fellowship and communion with my Heavenly Father through prayer. I commit to seek Him faithfully through prayer. If that's you, would you lift your hands right now? That's me. I commit to faithfully seeking God in prayer. Okay, put them down. If you're married and you're here with your spouse, I want you to think about this. Maybe you've never prayed together and the thought of praying together scares you. But you recognize that you really need the help of God. I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to seek God in prayer together. And I'm going to ask you if you're going to make this commitment to make it seriously by grabbing the hand of your spouse right now. And just to say that wherever we are, if it's just over meals or whatever it is, we are going to start praying together. And we're going to keep praying together. But we make this commitment. If that's you, would you lift your hands in the air to say that we're going to do that. We're going to pray together as a couple. Lord, I pray today that every believer under the sound of my voice would pursue you, seek you, desire to know you, not just talking to you, but listening in prayer. God, I pray that as we lift up requests to you, and as you answer them, that we would give you all the glory that we would see this world differently because we've petitioned heaven and you've heard our prayers. God, bring marriages together. Heal the marriages that are hurting. I pray over the next weeks that you would do miracles where there's been so little hope or even no hope. And I pray that we would realize with you all things are possible. We put our marriages before you and we ask, help us, God. We need your help. We believe a great marriage is possible if we continue to seek you. As you keep praying today, nobody looking around, there are some of you who realize right now the way you're living, the way you do life, God's not your number one. You may believe in God, but he's not your one. And let me tell you what, he wants to be. He wants to be. He loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to become sin for you, to die on the cross for our sins and to be raised from the dead because our sin separates us from God. We're, we're bent away from God. We do sinful things. We're sinners by nature and we need forgiveness. Because of what Jesus did, all of our sins can be forgiven. I'm telling you anything and everything you've ever done with anyone. You can be made new. 
And when he washes you and cleanses you, he not only is your savior, he wants to be the Lord of your life. That means first, King of kings, the Lord of lords, and you live for him. If you look at the way you spend your time, the way you spend your money, the way you invest your life, maybe right now you have to say, he's not my Lord. But from this day forward, from this day forward, I believe the Spirit of God is calling you. He will be your Lord. He will be your Savior. He will be your one from this day forward. If he's calling you, would you just lift your hands in the air? I hear you calling me, Lord, be my one. And let's pray together. No one prays alone. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Jesus, save me. Change me. Transform me and make me new. I believe that you died for me so that I could live for you. I thank you for the new life I have in you. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand together. Let's worship our good God.